This is Bernard Gersh from the Mayo Clinic, and with me today is um, Dr. Brian Cannon, who's Associate Professor of Pediatrics and also Director of Pediatric um, and Congenital Heart Electrophysiology. Welcome, Brian. I know it's a very complex area that you work in, but just want to focus today on one aspect of that, and, and that is really uh, the patient with Wolf Parkinson White syndrome, because Thanks to you pediatricians, we as adults don't see them anymore. You seem to be cherry picking, you know, <laughs> that population of patients for whom one can do so much. It's such a satisfying group to treat. Yeah. Well, sorry for you guys, but it's good for us and hopefully good for patients. Um, Wolf Parkinson White is relatively common in the population. We used to think it was about one in a thousand, but as we do more screening and more evaluation. Is this athletic screening? Yeah, it, ath more athletic screening and other screening for it attention deficit disorder medications and other things, the ECG screening has become much more prevalent. So many patients who would not normally get an ECG are now getting an ECG. So we're finding a lot more patients who have Wolf Parkinson's. So let's uh, focus down on that asymptomatic patient. Now, Wolf Parkinson's White Syndrome with palpitations, syncope, <coughs> atrial fibrillation, whatever, that, that's clear cut. Correct. But you find it as an incidental finding. Can you take us through your evaluation of that patient. Let's say it's a 10-year-old. Yeah, absolutely, so if you take a look at those patients, we actually do care if you have asymptomatic Wolf Parkinson White, because there is a very small percentage of patients that will actually present with sudden cardiac death as their initial finding. And if you look at the athletic- When you say very small, what is it? If you uh, take- of, of A thousand patients with WPW, uh, most of the sudden deaths will be in people with palpitations, right? Uh, Correct. Although up to 50% of the deaths are in patients with no palpitations at all. Really? In the, in, in the initial that. study by, by George Klein, yeah. there were three out of 25 patients that presented with uh, ventricular fibrillation and sudden death, and three of those were in the pediatric population. Interesting, none of those three had symptoms before. So younger that patients That was the study he did when he was at Duke, I think. Correct, um, yes, in, in, in 79, back. exactly. Correct. Okay, so... so so it is a concern. So take us just step by step through. So if you have a patient that presents like that, first of all, you want to carefully elucidate a history of symptoms. If they're old enough to run on a treadmill and perform an exercise treadmill test, what we do is we look for a loss of pre-excitation in a single beat, not the gradual loss of pre-excitation that we see as the AV node improves conduction, but actually you see an abrupt loss of pre-excitation. If you see that on a treadmill test or on a halter, it suggests that it's a low-risk pathway. Well, th that's an Im important point. I, ha I hadn't thought of that. So a gradual loss of pre-excitation could be because the AV node is speeding up secondary to catecholamines, and therefore you have less pre-excitation and more conduction down the AV node. Absolutely, and especially with a left-sided pathway that may be further away from the sinus. So sometimes it's, it's the hard sudden to loss of pre-excitation. Correct. You want to see that abrupt loss, preferably in a single beat. And if you do that, you can rest assured that it's yeah, almost certainly a This is a pathway that really pathway. can't conduct very fast. Correct. And if you can't tell based on the exercise treadmill test, um, it's reasonable to do a more invasive evaluation. Just before we get there, what about what's the role of the halter? The halter monitor, if you see in, intermittent pre-excitation either on an EKG, halter monitor, it suggests that it's a low-risk pathway. It's not quite as good as losing it in a single beat on a treadmill, but that's also suggestive that it's probably a low-risk pathway. So what will, um, you say it's probably suggestive, what's going to take you to an EP study? Well, I think that if you see intermittent pre-excitation right. in a patient that's truly asymptomatic, I think it would be reasonable to follow that patient. Even if it's just on a halter? Correct. Even okay. if it's just on a halter. However, if you don't see loss of pre-excitation or you can't be sure, particularly in somebody who wants to play competitive sports, I think it would be reasonable to perform a wrist stratification in the catheterization lab. And there's a couple of different ways you can do that. You can either do it with a transesophageal study or you can do it invasively through the femoral vessels. I mean, and I mean, really, the purpose of the study is to assess the refractory period and conduction times down the bypass tract and so the ability to induce atrial fibrillation and the speed of atrial fibrillation, Correct. I mean, the uh, speed of the r r ventricular response. Yeah. What so we how do you do that transesophageally? Uh, what we do is we induce atrial fibrillation. And actually, if you present clinically in atrial fibrillation, which about 10% of pediatric patients will have, or if you can induce it with a transesophageal study, or you can do it invasively. What you want to look for is what's called the shortest pre-excited right. 
RR interval, which means you look for two beats that are pre-excited in a row, and then you measure the distance. And if that's less than 250, particularly less than 220, that's a patient that's potentially at risk. Just one thing, if, 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 if the, the distance is a little longer than that, suggesting that they're not at high risk, you still, I mean, we, we do the studies at rest, and we don't know what's going to happen on the sports field Correct. when they have catecholamines. And is there a role for isoproteranol? Yeah, yeah if you look at the study? studies, it increases the conduction in a lot of these pathways. The question is, is that a clinically significant increase? But I think most people would say isoproteranol would be a reasonable option, particularly for the septal pathways that tend to be and, and, catecholamine and particularly sensitive. Particularly for competitive, yeah, you know, athletes. Absolutely. And, okay, now you've determined that this 10-year-old has a pathway that places him or her at risk. Do you go on and blate right then and there? I, I think so. I think that with the modern technology and the, the incidence of uh, complications with ablation being less than 2%, I think it allows us to be a little bit more aggressive with things like cryoablation and also mapping without using any radiation exposure. We can do this with a very low incidence and potentially get rid of the risk altogether. It seems very logical. I mean, certain in adult cardiology, it's accepted that for high risk, uh, with certain occupations like airline pilots, with symptomatic WPW, or even asymptomatic WPW, that you can ablate, why not um, do the ablation in, in a, an asymptomatic child? I mean, it's probably the closest we'll ever get to cures in cardiology. Absolutely, and we can do a success rate around 95% with a less than 1% to 2% incidence of complications. So if we have a very high success rate, with a very low complication rate and something that can be potentially permanently curative, I've been in favor of being a little bit more aggressive about uh, going after and ablating. Certainly makes sense. Well, thank you very much, Brian. Uh, that's a um, very helpful discussion on really uh, a rather satisfying disease and that we can treat it so well. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much for joining us.